All right, hello uh, over on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, so I've got almost everyone here. Um, let's try, my goodness, I'm having issues with tech already. There we go. So hi, everyone on um, Facebook, everyone on Instagram. Hello, everyone on YouTube. And thanks, everyone, for joining in and listening uh, on the podcast. Well, this is Startup Business Q&A episode 122. And the final one of November, so we're about to hit the final month of the year. And uh, like it is starting to get really mad. There's so many things happening now uh, in the rundown to the end of the year. So um, I hope you're keeping on top of things yourself, whatever you're up to. So we're going to focus today on deal making. It's a really exciting space. It's something actually we've not had as a topic before, although it's featured a lot through the questions. If you've not joined in these students before, this is um, called Start a Business Q&A. Every single week we're here, it's been about two and almost a half years now we've been doing this. Doing this. And if you are a startup, or if you're running a business, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a question, then do share it. It's something we can all collaborate on across the platforms and also I can do my best to answer it. Uh, I've been around for about 15 years in the business sales, marketing and online space. I was selling digital marketing back in 2003. Um, but what was fun is that uh, over the years I've worked with corporates, uh, big uh, eight and nine figure businesses, but I've also worked with startups, including many of my own, uh, and we've had some lovely successes with a lot of clients I have. So it's fun each week to do this. Uh, any questions on deal making in my space really is selling and it's an area I enjoy and coach a lot on. Uh, so uh, throw them in if there's any questions. Shout out on Facebook to Ian Tisker, who is uh, listening in today. It's his birthday. So can everyone wish him a happy birthday? Uh, right. Um, you know, congrats uh, on turning. I think it's 25, right, Ian? Uh, also, hello to Daniel, to Brandy, to Boo, to Angela uh, and everyone, and Lena, rather than everyone who's listening in uh, across the platforms. Um, thank you very much for watching this. So. Let's get straight into the questions. And any of you are, if you're closing deals at the moment or in your, if you're in that kind of process, give me a thumbs up so I can see uh, uh, who is actually involved in that. Hello, Bean, and nice to see you here too. So first question comes from Russ Avery. He said, Richard Moore, what's the best way to reach an agreement on a project scope in terms of how flexible I should be on and what the prospect or client wants for what price? Um, this actually... Uh, is a very interesting question because I think this gets to the heart of where a lot of pro people have problems. Um, it's it's that there is a stubbornness to stick to pre-decided uh, rules about what they want their um, their deals to look like before they've actually engaged in the process of ne negotiation. The reality is, by very kind of um, definition, negotiating as part of making deals is a very fluid process sometimes. And it can mean there's a lot of changes going on. Um, it's never always like, here's what I set out to do. Oh, and I got it. And I suppose what you really need to have is a bit of context for you, because here's the thing. When you first, for instance, when I first offered online consulting, I knew what I was worth, but I also knew I had no sales and no uh, clients. And so what I did was I focused all in on getting clients to get the ball rolling. Also, for many of us, um, first sales are about confidence, it's about validating our decision to sell a certain thing and proving a point that we actually know what we're doing. So what you've got to understand here is that it might be that you are actually willing to be flexible on quite a lot because you need a customer. If you're broke and you just need a little bit more money, you might be really extra flexible. Got to look at where your leverage is basically and so as what i'm saying here is if you have a huge pipeline and everyone is closing and you're rolling in customers you're in a better position to be a little harder with your price points if you are trying to make a name for yourself gain traction and so on you may need to be a little more flexible the, the balance, of course, is not coming across as desperate because flexibility means moving to a degree, but desperate is going to actually push the person away that you're working with. So that's a very important point here. It does depend on your position. And what you've got to ask yourself is, how am I doing against the most important thing here, which is beating out obscurity? Because really building a business, you need to be fighting against obscurity against you. And so when it comes to deal making and being flexible, you may well have to be more flexible because perhaps there isn't there aren't many irons in your fire and arguably less flexibility comes along because you have more things closing. So, for instance, the extreme version of this is actually 
not pushing customers away so much, but, but something I've been doing recently, which is um, deciding to not work with clients. So to say, you know, another word, a term for that is, is firing your clients and basically saying, you know what, we'll draw a line here, we'll call a day and actually doing the opposite. So saying we're not going to work together anymore because actually the flexibility I have is, is, is almost zero because there's so many other things that's on, that are on my plate. So that is where the that you need to analyze where your, what your backdrop is really, uh, Russ. You need to be saying to yourself, where am I in terms of what I really need? And it's not just about a customer. It's a case of saying, do I desperately need cash right now? You know, do I need experience right now? Do I need testimonials right now? In which case, are you getting what you need from this? Um, you know, it might be positioning, for example. Um, I'm visiting this week the offices of Facebook in London. Um, are they paying me? No. So one argument would be, well, you need to be, you, you should be trying to get money because you're doing, uh, you know, you're speaking with them, you're engaging with them and so on. But yeah, at the same time, the positioning and the value for me is so high that I'm willing to be flexible to the point that I'm actually not, you know, there's no money involved there. Um, so, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not that flexible that I'm going into London and just visiting Facebook. I'm actually doing it visiting a client that afternoon. I have a half day with a client. And so that's made the trip to Facebook very much worthwhile, if you see what I mean. So that flexibility is in essential. It's like speaking gigs, for example. People love to call themselves speakers and so on. Best thing to do to begin with is be a free speaker, because then you get some experience being a speaker. Then when you're good at being a speaker, people will then pay you. And it's a case of saying, what do I need to get at the beginning? So have those outcomes in mind. That really does make sense to do that. I do want to say hi to everyone who's hopped online. So Tinan, Sushi, uh, Rebecca, Brandy, um, Bina, Ian, um, Daniel. I think I saw Diana as well. Hello, you've hopped over to Instagram. Nice to see you as well. Uh, nice to see everyone who's jumping. We're talking about deal making today. Uh, for many people, uh, this is the thing that kind of gets in the way of it. They've got the great product. So many people love to polish their websites and wax on about how they believe in themselves and all of their posts. But actually, it comes to when it ultimately comes down to closing stuff off, you better be good at that as well. Otherwise, that all becomes a bit of a flash in the pan. Your business isn't got any oxygen. So let's look at another question. This one is from uh, Mona Nairi, um, and she's asked, Richard, how do you leverage social media for selling? In her case, she's added getting donations for a nonprofit. When the organization doesn't want to spend money on ads, but the organic traffic to the page seems to be from uh, only from the like warriors, presumably, presumably meaning people who are just the same, really. So, or like what people who just like liking stuff. Got it. Okay. So this is the thing that most people don't do, which is one of the most obvious and simplistic things to do, but it requires a tax on your most valuable asset, which is your time. The way you s leverage sales, social media for selling in the way that tends to really work, although it's a longer play, is you just... You've got to work on the manual basis. You work with the community. And what it is, is, and here's the thing, you're already winning. If you have like warriors, so people love to like stuff, they are the people right there who have decided to validate, um, you know, your, your content. I would say for every like of a post, there's probably 10 other people who didn't bother liking. So those who reached out and decided to click on like, you need to go and engage with them one on one. Not selling, just start the process of saying hi. And if you were to do five a day, just say hi, thank you for that like. All you're doing is beginning a wonderful process of validating for them the reason why they liked it. So they're going to start coming back for other posts and liking those as well and engaging in conversation. So now we're naturalizing them to conversation as well. So now they're more likely to, sh to share and post too. But now we actually get to know the person behind the like, Mona. And social media, what people don't understand for the majority of time is they're putting out, out there content and hoping it'll just go viral. Content is your bait. Okay, so in this case, content is your bait to get people into orbit to check it out. And those that like, those that engage, are the people you go down and speak to. I say down, because we like to think we're up on our throat. Get down away from that content. Don't just sit there hoping people come to you. You're, you're asking for too much. So instead, go to them. Thank them for the like. Get to know them. Oh, but I don't have time for that. Well, then be cool with no, no interest. 
if you want people to donate to your nonprofit, they need to be warmed up and feel like it's a nonprofit worth donating to. So unless they can exercise telepathy, it's far better to engage with them one on one to start with and talk to them about what you're doing. Engage, make them feel interested in what you're what you're all about, because then, of course, you build layer upon layer of engaged people in your work. Soon enough, two, three months later, you've got very many more likes and those like warriors. Many of them have converted into people who are doing things with you. It is the singular most uh, impactful act you can do is to manually engage with each person that dares like your stuff. OK, I'm talking about DMs here because you never know who you'll find. And five a day you have time for. But five a day is 150 a month. Right. In every quarter, that's 450. That's enough people that can start donating. And that's how you genuinely build a community. It's not just through great content. The content is the device to bring people close. And then you have to engage in conversation in the same way as a networking event is a device to bring people together. But nothing happens until you talk to them. So it's the same principle here. And it's stunning that people drop the ball. I, I hope I'm not throwing you on the bus here at the moment, but it's stunning people don't do that. You know, you post and you leave them be. It doesn't work. The whole point of the post is to bring people in. You've only done half the job. Now go engage with people manually. Okay, that's the way to do it. So let's look at some of the comments here. Uh, Sushi, which is very wise, thank you very much. Uh, um, I did it, I started with pro bono talks and, and now getting paid, absolutely the way to do it. Uh, Brandy, lowering your price at first doesn't mean you're lowering your standards either. Be clear with clients. Yes, I totally agree. The stupidity of stubbornness means that some people go, oh no, but I'm worth so much. So I, I, I'm gonna charge this amount and then you're broke. And it's like, it's, it, you need to get the ball rolling. Uh, you know, you need to people have people talk about you. It's far more effective to have people talking about you because that helps market you than hold out for that one big deal because you're worth it. You know, just get on with it because in the, in the time it takes for you to eventually find someone who's willing to pay the full rate whilst you're currently obscure and no one knows about you, you could have been packing in a few other clients as well, plus building experience and building your, your, your own confidence. It really validates what you're doing when you start getting people pay for you. So, you know, that's a, a strong way to look at it. Okay. So, um, uh, give me a thumbs up if that makes sense next week. Uh, or a couple of notices Thursday this week, I will be back in London. I'm in London three days this week, but London, I'm going to be meeting a uh, chap at Facebook. Uh, thank you to dot Lung for setting that up. Um, is a series of things I've decided to do. I wanted to do this for a while now is each month, I'm going to be um, uh, visiting a different company, an interesting company, and asking them questions. So almost like a bit of a um, an interview, uh, finding someone there, meeting them, having a little bit of a tour around the offices, and asking them questions about uh, you know online business and entrepreneurship and things like that. So the likes of Microsoft and LinkedIn, and as I say this week, Facebook are a kind of queued up if you like to do this i'm mean, looking forward to doing these and sharing uh this kind of content in vlog form with you guys i think it'd be interesting to to have those kind of discussions and see what they have to offer to the kind of people that that are in this ecosystem in addition next week on wednesday was it wednesday or thursday the sixth i'll be in geneva for the linkedin local panel if you know anyone in switzerland or in geneva who could attend and let them know um but i'm, I'm keen as well uh, to to share you know a good vibe about uh, LinkedIn uh, in that group and um, and in addition to this I wanted to say um, thank you to Devon Scott who is collaborating with me on building my Alexa skill so those of you interested in sales we've started work on an Alexa skill the first iteration will be fifty two um, so one per week if you want to so fifty two tips in sales so you can say you know Alexa and turn up set Alexa check it off uh, so Alexa to give me my sales skill uh, and it'll give you like one for that week you can use them all in one day if you wanted but it's just to start with it'll be a case of fifty two uh, and their sales tips you can tap into and finally I wanted to say thank you to Mona Nairi and to uh, Nadine Langlois who are both helping. Uh, build out the amazing uh, newsletter that goes out today at 6 p.m. GMT. So if you're not signed up, please make sure you are on the richardmore.com forward slash newsletter. 
uh, and you can put in your name and email and you can receive that at the end of the day. That is content from me, content from epic people uh, and also news that is valuable about the digital marketing space. There's a really important article, uh, like a digest of social media platforms and the latest trends for 2019 written by Forbes that would put in that one today. Um, and that includes uh, changes on things like LinkedIn as well. So those of you in the LinkedIn thing, uh, jump in and make sure you register for that. So it comes out 6 p.m. today. Make sure you register therichardmore.com forward slash newsletter. Uh, but do it after this, right? So <laughs> just finish up a few more. Uh, so a few more questions here. Daniel Nunes, what are your thoughts on non-disclosure agreements? My genuine, genuine thoughts are that they are often used when they're not needed um, with some businesses. I think, uh, this is just my experience, is, is that I think things like that are of course valuable where there's some IP, some intellectual property that really is valuable. But I think also that people create NDAs because they don't want anything, they, they fear people taking market share away from them, things like that. I get it. but really, you're probably not reinventing the wheel that much. And your NDA really should be if there's something like an algorithm or maybe some piece of tech that is so innovative uh, or that it really requires to be, it's going to be patented or something like that. But in the main, people have NDAs for things like you know the most the weakest things like we're setting up a new webinar don't want else to hear about because we think we've got a good idea just get on with it you know and i think it for, for many it's something that just gets in the way a bit and it's a fear that other people will jump in on their parade remember facebook wasn't first to the party uh i'm not saying that you know that it's the same as with an mda but it's like don't worry too much about people copying your stuff be the best at what you're doing that's the main thing it's not about being first ever it's about being best and if you're worried about other people going to take your idea, it may well be that they don't execute on it as well because it's your idea and your passion. And if it's not, well, then you probably don't deserve to win anyway because you're doing something you don't really care about that much. And if you deserve to be the best, because you are, and you've got the best execution of an idea, well, then go for it. And, and the end there doesn't matter so much. Uh, but, but I am caveating that, that for some it is important. Um, but I think it, people throw things like that in more than is needed. So I would need more, more, more kind of detail to know specifically what it's about, though. Uh, let's have another question here um, from Brandy Holloway. What parts of a business deal should you be flexible with in negotiations and which ones should you always stand your ground on? But this is similar in a way to Russ Avery's question. And um, there's so much variety here. And the thing is, of course, Brandy, that um, we need to understand that some things are important to us, some things aren't. Um, and, and over time that will evolve. So for instance, you know, um, working with someone at a substantially reduced price or even for free, just to start to close a deal because I need a client, I need proof of concept. I need some social proof that I can stick as testimonials on a website or in Facebook ads, or something like that means that the thing that of value is of value to me isn't cash it's actually <laughs> it's actually the fact i've got a client in the first place so in this case it may well be that you can be as flexible as you like because actually you just need the client there you know I, know I know someone whose business works with google google is one of their clients and you know she could she said to me that you know you kind of do whatever is needed to make sure that you get that one and keep them because that one's the, they're the ones from which you leverage huge other amount of customers in as well so you've got to think about that that kind of bigger picture as well um but look, one one good rule of thumb is look at what things are of low value to you so stuff you could do without and things that are high value to you so it may be the price for example it may be that you get to state that you can work with that company it may be that you get a testimonial from them it might be that there's something more kind of touchy-feely that you get out of this relationship um, or it may be something else. But one thing is for sure, you need to make sure that it's a win-win scenario. If you feel like you're being screwed and they feel like they're winning, that's not ever a good deal. It's always important to make sure you feel like you both win. Um, if you are winning and you're screwing them, it's not cool at, at all. It will just eventually come back and bite you. And if it doesn't, then you're, it's a one heck of a risk to hope that that won't happen. So I think that Again, it's, it's difficult because your 
for instance, recently, um, I uh, worked on a deal that actually was substantially lower in monetary value than it would be uh, for another company. Um, it's just that was circumstantial. But the value given and received was sufficiently high that it kind of offset it. It was worth it. There was a recipro reciprocity that went beyond the money. And, you know, I think I think one thing to bear in mind as well is that sometimes being so flexible that you do give them what the feeling that they're getting more than you're getting is important because then the uh, the experience of buying from you will be a positive one as well. There are two ways in which people buy things. Sometimes it can be uh, that they feel it, they're buying it, but they kind of begrudgingly buying it. And other times people buy something, but actually feel really great about it. And you want the latter. You want them to think I've done really well out of this rather than, oh, OK, I've got this deal and that's that. You know, they want to, you want them to feel like what a great experience that was. That really does make a big difference. So, uh, yeah, I hope that helps a bit, Brandy. I think you've asked another question here. Another current situation I have is I deal with a business owner to create a marketing action plan and strategy locally and online she cannot be consistent which means she cannot she cannot suggest by the way brandy that she is unable to i suppose she doesn't want to so if you if you're online uh, do clarify that um she cannot be consistent which means i cannot do my job do i squash the deal do i create a different deal for her to include outsourcing which means more of an investment on her end she's already invested three thousand dollars and i've much done much to work to offer a refund so here's the thing often we feel like someone who isn't being flexible uh is throwing our deal under the bus but the reality is it's us that needs to be flexible it may just be that there is a different way of doing things and you could do things differently where her lack of relative consistency probably to yours um means that actually uh um, you know you need to just work in a different way so I did this recently with a client um, who had a team member who wasn't consistent uh, with um, the way they kind of delivered their work. So rather than trying to push all the time, like, you got to, you got to, you got to, it was like, well, why don't you take what this person's good at, the elements within the lack of consistency that they do do well, and scale out of that. So, for instance, if they cannot or will not um post consistently for instance if I, I'm, I'm this is conjecture brandy because i don't know exactly what they're not being consistent with but if for instance they only post three times a week and your strategy suggests they post five times a week so then take the content as pillar content break it down and now you can create more posts so for instance if they do a video one video out of that video you'll get a quote you can take a screen grab, add the quote. Now you've got an Instagram quote based meme for them. You can then download the, app, the audio. Now you've got a podcast. You can do a snippet of that video. Now you've got a short video, which is an Instagram post, story, Facebook, LinkedIn. Do you see what I mean? So, for instance, this I'm streaming on LinkedIn. As you, sorry, not on LinkedIn. Like that's the dream. Streaming on, on YouTube. Um, Facebook and Instagram and this will convert also into other smaller videos and, and photos and things like that and thumbnails and audio for podcasts and so on so you can create consistency okay by hacking at what you're doing what do you mean by she isn't consistent does it mean she doesn't show up she can't produce the content is there something against her what, what is she good at this is a larger discussion for right here but but that's what I was saying with this client I had um, uh, worked with in the past, it was a case of saying, so this thing is not working, you want them to do this, but this isn't going to happen. So let's look at the things they do do well. Let's maybe change direction slightly. So sometimes it's us that has to adapt. If you, you just went to hear it on the, on the comments, she hasn't done anything except videos. Great. Do you need her to be consistent every day with video? If so, or, or we're doing other things, then fantastic. You can take the videos, a still with a filter, maybe their logo, maybe a bit of text. Now you've got an image. Do you see what I mean? Get, if you don't have the time, now it's a VA to do that. Do you see what I mean? so, so it's working with the, on the basis that maybe she can't produce mad amounts of content. And this is efficiency. Even if you look at those with a huge media production team behind them, they still follow this efficient approach. So if you look at, as is famous for it, is Gary Vaynerchuk, has huge amounts of content across multiple platforms. However, 
it all stems from only several pieces of content. So if there's a particular thing happening on a particular day, an event or a meeting or something, that becomes a downloadable podcast. They become snippets of videos and they become memes and so on as well. That's how they create a lot more content from the singular thing. That is how to do it. As I said, I'm recording once for one hour on a Monday at 1 p.m. However, I'm simultaneously posting right now on three platforms. I will also later this week be generating content from this from LinkedIn. And later today, my podcast will go live. So just that alone is five pieces of content from one thing I'm doing. See what I mean? So I appear consistently able to generate more content. But in fact, it comes from one singular moment because tomorrow and Wednesday, I will be back to back with clients. So I'm not consistent in content creation each day. OK, but there may be certain days of the week where you do get the commitment and then you draw things out like that. So that, that's what you need to hack around. Them. And if we look here, you've said, you know, I can too done too much work to offer even and so on. That's the thing. It's that agility that's important. And the thing to always remember is that it's for us as the service provider to be the adaptable one. OK, um, I'm working with a personal trainer uh, at times. And the whole point we're working with him is that he's like he understands I'm not going to create more time to do the personal training kind of thing. I have the time I have. And so it's for him to streamline workouts around the work I do. Do you see what I mean? So I think um, that's important. You know, so it's for us to be adaptable around them and, and we need to find ways to do it. OK, uh, I've read about this a while back. Actually, there was a, there was a guy once who was an author and he was asked by someone at some corporate, uh, some very, very important person in a big business, I can't remember who, uh, she said to him, I want to have a book written about me and he said great okay so here's what you're gonna need here's gonna what, what you're gonna need to do and he was very traditional about it he was saying we need to spend time each day writing he was saying you need to be consistent he's like i'll have time to write i'm here because i don't have time to write and he re looked at this and he said do you know what i need to do all i need to do is record her just get her to talk and then i will take that download the audio get it transcribed now i've got myself a book that's how I created my first downloadable uh, um, book. It was a, a, a talk I did, which in fact then became an audio book. And I had a VA transcribe the, uh, the audio into text. Then I had one of these programs come in what it is that creates a PDF, throw a few images in and there's your book. And it takes a heck of a lot less time. So you need to hack at the approach. Don't take it traditionally. It's not a separate piece of content being created every day. It's something different. OK, so hopefully that helps. But don't don't throw the deal away. You've got to be adaptable. And the more adaptable you can be, the more straightforward it is when you have an easy uh, client. But then, you know, it means you're able to work with those where you have the curveballs thrown at you. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Brandy, a great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, let's do a couple more. So a uh, question from uh, Ian Tisker. So again, happy birthday, Ian. Uh, thanks for watching uh, over there in the States. Uh, is there a process you use for building value in the negotiation? What can we apply in our deal making that will help build the value around our product or service? I think what's weird about um, negotiating and closing is that often people go a bit different. They change how they are a bit. And what you need to never lose sight of, in my experience, and again, 15 years of closing deals, so I'd like to hope I've got some experience, what you mustn't lose sight of is why they're really keen on you in the first place. And that might be your product or service. It might be some, it's probably, not, not that it might be, it probably is a particular element about it. So if you don't know what it is, ask them, you know, what, out of interest, what is the most interesting part about this for you at the moment? Whatever that is, and by the way, this is a very important thing, it's usually you, it's not so much the product or service, unless you are so groundbreakingly breaking innovative. Um, with all respect, for instance, to Brandy, if you're doing online um, social media strategy, you know, it's a very abundant service at the moment. It's not particularly innovative in the sense that everyone's doing this kind of thing, or well, a lot of people are doing this kind of thing. So the difference has to be Brandy or the approach or the way in which she beds in with the client. And so 
what happens a lot when it comes to negotiating and deal making is that everyone gets if they've been fun and enjoying the process so far now they get a bit too serious or if they've been too serious they they may be kind of uh they're they're overthinking how they engage with this person they're just just going to keep life simple as they did before and i think one thing to remember is whatever they fell in love with you need to remind them of that through it so if you've had fun building the relationship then keep the fun when it comes to closing the deal it's wrong in my opinion i don't say that often because often there's different ways of doing things but i feel it's wrong to say things like deals shouldn't have humor in them i read it once in a book and i don't believe that to be honest um deals should have humor in them you should have fun with them if the person and you have that relationship prior to that moment when you're deal making so i think that the process i use for building value is reminding them that i'm a good guy because usually my one of my big leverage points as well as whatever value i'm giving in terms of the service is one of my big leverage points is that i i like to build a strong relationship so they feel like i you know there's confidence in working with me okay so i spend time with them and i get to know them and i give i listen and so on and by doing that in a good enough way that they're like oh that this guy really gets this um i i lead through the deal making process and and keep that sense of um touch with them you know so there's that connection we feel still like we're engaged rather than suddenly it becomes some robot and trying to close something so i don't want to go weird or desperate or change or, or be different or strange with them uh, i want to keep it as it was because that's the reason why we're in this position in the first place i hope that helps you but this is very very important to make sure you don't suddenly go all strange on them because then they're it, it worries people when they're about to give you uh, maybe some money or something like that. They will they will suddenly get a bit worried that you're changing, and that's not what they've signed up to. That's a subconscious reaction, but it's an important one nonetheless. Um, so to think about it that way. Um, let's do uh, one last question. I think we've got another one here from Russ Avery. Another one I think people would appreciate would be, he says uh, would be Do you have any tips on how to turn a one off deal into a retainer where the service is appropriate? And could be delivered as a retainer of course yeah i've done this myself and what i've done is essentially what you want the one-off service to be is a bit of a tease so that the retainer as in paying you money every month to be with you long term is uh is is something that, that you can convert so i would offer a light or smaller version of your service i know that at russ you run a consultancy so what i would do is I, I ran, um, I was doing consulting, so three months people would buy, a stack of three months, and then they would pay monthly. I would often do things like, give me two weeks, or give me a month, and I would just blow their minds. That's the idea. Because if you deserve it, as in, if they say, I can't live without you, then you tend to move to a place where they want to work with you long term, and asking them, you know, would you like to explore what it would look like if we work together some more. That question is usually met with a hell yes, because you've done something. So there's a guy um, I worked with uh, a while back and, you know, I created a situation where I not only saved him literally thousands of dollars on a deal, but I also helped him generate thousands of dollars as well. So it was so simple to say, oh my God, how, how the hell could I not work with you? After two weeks, I said, I'd like a testimonial and, and a chat after two weeks. And I just said, you know, how's it gone? He's like, this has just been amazing. It's been game changing. Good. So would you like to talk about what it would look like if we worked together longer term? Hell yes. And it's not difficult to sell them because they're saying yes, basically. So that's that's an important way of looking at things. Uh, being uh, Diana, you just asked me, I don't know where you are on Facebook or Instagram. You said, work with me. Happy to work with you. I would like to speak to you straight after this. If you could, please. I need to speak to you about something. Uh, so if you stay on one of these platforms, and I'll, I'll send you a DM and I can connect there. But um, there's there's so much in the deal making sp uh, space. And I think the, the, if we look at some main tips, some main, main takeaways, um, I would say make sure you retain the essence of what got you guys, got, or rather got you and the other party together in the first place. What is it they were really interested in? What elements of the service you're offering? And it's probably likely that one of the main elements there is you. So retain that throughout this process. Also learn that being flexible is probably a good idea because even if you do the biggest deal of your career, in the scheme of things, it's a drop in the ocean probably. So it doesn't really matter. 
And the best thing to do is get a new client that fulfills certain needs for you. It might be that you need money right now. So your flexibility is in giving everything you possibly can so that they close. OK, it might be that money's not so much of an issue right now because you're doing well. So you look at what other things are needed. So, for instance, if 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 money is no big problem for you, you're doing fine. Well, then that client, you want it, you want it to be maybe that you're not working your nuts off to service them. You're, you're, it's a it's a client where actually it's going to be very straightforward. Do you see what I mean? So, so you need to think about your flexibility representing the space you're in right now. And um, I think finally. Uh, the, the main thing to remember is uh, one thing I've not shared yet is that people don't buy the moment when there's a deal. People buy what they the potential for what they're going to have after that. You're interested in the deal, in the negotiation, in that close. But what they're buying is the relationship afterwards, is how it's going to work with you afterwards. So what you need to be doing is, is talking a lot about next steps and how it's going to be and making them visualize where you're going to go in the next days and weeks and months with them. Because the relationship after and how you look after them and, and Rolls Royce them through a process of winning through your service or product, that is the thing they are really interested in buying. And so outwardly, the perception should be at least that that's what's of interest to you in this discussion and making that work rather than just closing. And I can speak about that because I've, I've been in a place in many years ago where that was the whole point of, of the way we worked. And it wasn't as effective. Focus on closing the deal sounds cool and sounds very fashionable. Uh, but the thing is, you focus on the deal outwardly they are often often what can we lose sight of it lost what can lose sight of is the reason why you wanted to engage in the first place it's a very important point they are interested in the outcome you're interested in the deal so you need to try at least tune into the outcome because actually it's, it's important that you show you care as well so hopefully that helps um thanks to everyone for joining and i hope that was valuable it was only a short one today any more questions on deal making do let me know um, and if you are not signed up to the newsletter, please do Richard, the Richard forward slash newsletter. Uh, that's coming out at six o'clock GMT today. So in about four hours, really exciting because there's some very interesting content on that one. I hope the questions were answered well. Thank you to Mona, Russ, Brandy, Daniel and Ian. Happy birthday. And I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks very much. So bye bye over on instagram see you later on um youtube make sure you're subscribing uh if you 